So what I'm going to do today is actually preview a uh, talk that I put together for the fifth session of a uh, physics of information class that I'm doing online for the Acting Inference Institute. And um, this session's on space time. And I wanted to do this here for a couple of reasons. Uh, reason number one is this uh, particular session contains a um, kind of hypothesis about biological systems that I wanted to bounce off this group. And the second one is that uh, the question of where space-time comes from is, I think, particularly relevant in biology. And I think we can turn it into a small biological question as well as a developmental biological question and even a developmental psychological question. And so I wanted to sort of throw those ideas around and see what people find. So um, a real brief review of, of where we've gotten to in this class that I know Hananel is in and, and some of the rest of you are maybe in. Um, it's, it's a class about quantum information theory, and this is a super simple model system for thinking about uh, communication between entities. Um, we can think of, of two entities which together comprise the entire universe of interest. So we can think of these two entities as jointly isolated. And the theory is just a general way to describe how these entities exchange information over some mutual boundary. So um, this whole approach to quantum theory is based on information exchange across boundaries. And it turns out to be a, a really kind of powerful thinking tool for thinking about how communication constrains the structure of systems. So we can think of, of the boundary as uh, an information channel that has a particular structure. And since we're using quantum theory, we can think of the boundary as, as comprising some array of, of qubits, so quantum bits that can be measured or prepared by either system and talk about how that happens. Um, we're doing this in part to understand the free energy principle better. And so a couple of years ago, uh, Mike and Carl Friston and some other colleagues and I put together a paper. I think actually it was just Jim Blazebrook uh, reformulating the free energy principle in quantum theoretic language. And if you reformulate it that way, then uh, one can show that the free energy principle is actually a, a classical limit of the principle of unitarity, which is just the principle of conservation of information. And the principle of unitarity is the fundamental principle of quantum theory. So it makes the free energy principle kind of naturally fall out <laughs> of just the assumption that you can describe the world with quantum theory, which is kind of a nice result because it makes the free energy principle look less strange. Mm -hmm. uh, and Carl's done a lot of work showing that uh, the free energy principle provides you with a foundation for all of classical physics. So um, relating it to quantum theory kind of closes an important loop there. And one thing that it does is automatically induce compartmentalization in any communicating systems that are interesting in a very specific sense. Um, it induces compartmentalization whenever an agent has multiple ways of interacting with the world and it can't deploy them simultaneously for whatever reason. So maybe it can't deploy them for some kind of deep physical reason. Uh, like you can't measure spin along the z-axis and the x-axis at the same time uh, because those operations don't commute mathematically. 
but it may be that it can't deploy them simultaneously for a much more prosaic reason. It doesn't have enough free energy to thermodynamic free energy in the fuel to both do this and this. So it has to have some attention system that says, I can act on the world this way, or I can act on the world this way, but I don't have the ability to do both. So even that very classical energy limitation on whether systems can be deployed simultaneously induces this kind of compartmentalization. And as soon as you have compartmentalization between ways of interacting with the world, you have to have some way of managing what you're going to do. So you, you kind of automatically induce a meta-processing system, an attention system, an energy regulation system, uh, just by the demands of not being able to do everything all at once. So the, the physics kind of by, by itself gives you some interesting anatomy that one can then ask, uh, how, how is that implemented even at the cell biology level? And that, so it provides a different way of approaching cell biology that's driven not by the chemistry, but by the kinds of computations that the cell is implementing. We were talking earlier um, at the lunch table, or whatever it is about, you know, how do you take this horrible spaghetti <clears throat> mess that's the pathway diagram for a cell that abstracts out all of the interesting geometric constraints and time constraints and that sort of thing from the inside of the cell and turn it into um, some sort of compartmentalized structure um, that tells you where the, where the borders are within that mess, where the cells have to exchange classical information in some data structure. So in effect, where are the APIs inside the cell? Um, which is the kind of question that doesn't naturally arise in other representations. So just to make sure that I'm on the same page, the compartmentalization you show here, like green, orange, red, the green and the red would be Alice and Bob in your initial uh, uh, example, where they're two separate, green and red are the two compartments or any two compartments are separate entities that need to exchange information classically through your qubit. Right, map. right. Okay. Except with respect to the original boundary, Green and red are different compartments in Alice. Okay. And they're both looking at Bob, who's on the other side of the map. I see. Okay. So actually, the next. But could question. you also reform it such that instead, if green and red were inside of Alice, could you also think about them as Alice and Bob in this case? Like as long as they're talking to somebody else. Okay. Right. Okay. So actually, let me show you the next slide. Oh, okay. That might. Okay. Oh, you can. Reformulate that diagram in a simpler way. So, here what I've done is green and red are now Q1 and Q2. These are two okay. quantum processes acting within some overall quantum computer, but they're distinct quantum processes. So, they have to be compartmentalized in the way that it was before. And um, you can use this kind of picture to represent two agents interacting with a common environment that are employing both a classical channel, so they're talking to each other in language, and they're both measuring some shared quantum system. Okay. And this is exactly what happens in all experiments that detect entanglement. Yeah. And in fact, this is the minimal organization to be able to detect entanglement. So it's the it's the the kind of bottom line comment is that in order to detect entanglement, you have to have classical communication. And so at the very at the very depth of uh, all of quantum information technology is a requirement for a kind of communication that isn't quantum communication, it's classical communication. Can so, I think of breaking, sort of taking the 
big mess of lots of, you know, lots of communication and lots of stuff flowing around inside of a cell and trying to break it into, like you were saying before, the, the sort of chunk-sized APIs that communicate over a somewhat minimal amount of, 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 of you know, wired signals. That doesn't sound like a quantum problem to me. So how does that, how does all the, 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 the mechanism and formalism of quantum mechanics help? Um, or am I just totally misunderstanding? Well, no, I'm using the quantum formalism as a particularly simple way of talking about communication. But the other thing it gives to you is a localization of thermodynamic requirements. And so a localization of thermodynamic free energy requirements to only the places where you're encoding classical information. So one motivation for doing this is this analysis that Mike and I did a few years ago of to what extent can you represent the state changes inside a cell, and in particular protein conformational changes, as classical computation in the way that they're actually represented in, say, classical molecular dynamic simulations, where you think of proteins as sort of exploring this, this configurational state space. And it turns out that, that cells lack the free energy resources to do that by orders of magnitude. So they have to be using some other resource, some you know, coherence resource that's energetically free to do some of this computation. So one question motivated by that is, where do they have to store quantum information? Or where, sorry, where do they have to exchange classical information that really is energetically expensive and that they really do have to put metabolic resources into? And so there, there are kind of obvious answers in the cell. You know, wherever proteins are bound to a membrane, they're transmitting a classical state across the membrane to whatever information process is, is happening on the other side. Um, but there are probably other boundaries that we can't see just by looking at, say, an electron micrograph, where there are classical APIs. But at least it raises that question, where are the APIs inside the cell? You know, and how can we cut this up into modules that we know have to communicate by some sort of classical information exchange, given that it can't be happening everywhere. So anyway, um, so that's just a, a very brief summary of where we've been <laughs> in this now multi-month um, course. And now we're finally to um, some of the part that's really biologically interesting uh, to do with space. But before I talk about space time, and this was actually motivated by questions that uh, were asked after one of the other sessions, and Mike's seen some of what is immediately to follow before because I shared some of it in the previous meeting that was the last few days. I wanted to talk a little bit about explanation because it raises an interesting question about the scale dependence of biological processes. So let's start by contrasting uh, reductionist and scale free theories. So um, the sorts of um, theoretical approaches that we learned in undergraduate school, um, in undergraduate physics and chemistry, for example, where uh, you know, there's stuff going on at the molecular level and, and the stuff going on at the cellular level is just some emergent process from all of that chemistry. Um, with a scale-free type of theory, like the theory underlying that's underlaid by the free energy principle, which is a, a scale-free description of how systems of any type communicate with their environments and build models of their environments and behave in their environments. So in, in any kind of reductionist theory, the basic idea is that explanation 
all the, all the real, the important stuff handles happens at some preferred scale. And uh, whatever's happening at larger scales is emergent or epiphenomenal or something like that. It, it's, it either doesn't matter at all or uh, it's some sort of packaging of uh, what's happening at the lower scales. <clears throat> and so the fundamental assumption is that there's a fundamental scale at which that's most important. Whereas in a scale-free theory, uh, the approach is very different. The scale-free theory postulates that there's some kind of dynamics, and that dynamics happens at every scale. Right. Yeah. And as you move between scales, what you're seeing are different implementations of the That's same right. theory. So it's a very different way of thinking about theory. And I would suggest that, that a lot of science is actually not reductionist, even though scientists talk about it as if it was reductionist, because I think they learned in school that they should say. Mm -hmm. uh, and the scale free approach is kind of more difficult to think about in a certain sense. So if we go back to that picture of systems talking to each other across a boundary, and you ask about scale, then the way to represent scale is the density at which information is encoded on that boundary. And we can think about a whole spectrum of scales that are already given to us by uh, physical theory, for example. We can think of energy scales or space, spatial scales or temporal scales. And all of those are coupled together by the basic physics or basic physical constraints. So the kind of smallest possible physically definable scale is the Planck scale, um, where an energy of about 10 to the 19th GeV, so 10 to the 19th billion electron volts, is uh, compressed into a spatial scale of 10 to the minus 35 meters. So that's that defines the boundary of a black hole. Basically, anything that encodes information at that scale is a black hole. And 10 to the 19th GeV is, is uh, what is it? Uh, about 15 orders of magnitude larger than the energy density that we can get with the Large Hadron Collider. So it's a very high energy density compared to what we can produce in the laboratory. So the, uh, the scale about 1 GeV is the scale at which nucleons exist. And that corresponds to a distance scale of about 10 to the minus 50 meters. So the nucleons about FM20 in size. Um, and our scale, our natural scale, is about a meter. And the associated energy is very low. That's radio frequency energy. So if you think about light, light's about 10 to the fifth higher energy than radio waves. So light feels energetic to us, and radio waves don't. And that's just a, a fact about our size, that light seems very energetic compared to something like radio, which is our natural scale. So we can think about the boundary as, to, as encoding this information at practically different scales. So now how do we think about science in this framework? And we're all familiar with, with uh, kind of reduction of science, where we assume a fundamental scale. And this is the best example, right? You have some event that happens at some incredibly tiny scale in space and time at very high energy. And that sets all the parameters for all of physics and produces all the organized structure that we see in the world. I imagine. And that's called the Big Bang Theory. Uh, so the Big Bang Theory is, is, in a sense, the ultimate reductionist theory that says that all of the important parameters that characterize everything are up to noise 
and nothing else fixed at the Planck energy, the Planck time, the Planck spatial scale, and everything else just happens. So what we're looking for is a way of thinking about science and scientific explanation that's different from that. And it's hard to find an example <laughs> that with this sort of nice illustrated picture. So we have to draw a picture. And in the kind of notation we've used here, uh, the picture looks sort of like this. We've got this system on the other side of the boundary. And that system is changing through some kind of God's eye time parameter. And we're looking at it. Our system, Alice, is looking at the boundary where Alice can see encodings at different scales. And let's call those scales one and two. And what's happening on the boundary at these different scales is changing. So if Alice looks at with you know, a magnifying glass that sees scale number one, then she sees some changing pattern bits. And if she looks with a different magnifying glass that sees scale number two, uh, she sees some changing pattern bits. And she can construct the theory about how these bits change over time. And that could be, for example, some Markov process that captures that theory. And then the interesting question is, how do those two relate? So can you construct a semantic theory, an embedding theory that says, OK, bit patterns at this scale have some correlation, and uh, there's some part of the correlation structure of bits at this, say, small scale that matches the behavior uh, individual bits at this very large scale. So I construct some sort of, if you will, linguistic mapping from, from the language that seems natural at this scale to the language that seems natural at that scale. And it's how those theories change through time that's the really interesting question. And you like your these semantic mappings to stay fixed because then you know what you're talking about. As you progress through time and make these different kinds of measurements. So, this picture should look familiar because this is how computer science works. Yeah. And so, we can translate all this into to the language of computer science. Now, the scales are different programs, um, which may be things like an operating system versus a user interface versus what we call the hardware level, which really isn't the hardware level. It's a high-level description of what a bunch of stuff is doing. And we can keep going down in scales uh, you know, with a laptop or something. The upper scale is kind of the user interface scale. But what we're doing in, in computer science is constructing exactly this kind of semantic map between different ways of describing one process. And we do that by assigning meanings and mapping those meanings into each other. So that's why I call it the semantic mapping. And um, with computers, we design them so that they can be so constant. So you know, I was talking about the relationship between you know, the C compiler and so HTML or something in, in a way that, that doesn't change. So what we can then ask is, uh, and here's the, where we start to get into biology. Uh, what's the actual relationship between these embedding theories in biology? You can think about biology in this scale free way which if we think in a free energy principle framework we're doing, uh, then we can ask what the embedding theories look like as we go from thinking about how we embed pathways into cells, cells into tissues, or tissues into organisms, or organisms into social groups, or communities, or whatever, all the way up to the biosphere level. We have all these different embedding theories. 
And this gives us a set of scale transitions. And if we want to represent sets of scale transitions, we can turn to, again, a mathematical formalism uh, and represent it as a renormalization group, which is just uh, a set of operators that move things between different scales. And we can ask how different are these transitions between different scales? And so I'll just put on the table a hypothesis to think about, which is the hypothesis that in the biological systems, those scale transitions all look like the same thing. They're all formally equivalent. And I don't know whether that's true. <laughs> I don't even know how to approach trying to prove that it's true or not true. But if it was true, it'd be really cool. <laughs> because if you mean that the theory was super, super simple, you'd have the free energy principle in one scale operator. And with that, you could do all the embeddings. So um, I'll just leave that as something to think about. Uh, but be that as it may, we've done something really important here which is we've linked physics to computer science. And we've done it in a way that um, is not just reconstructing sort of some God's eye view of physics with computer science. We're trying to construct physics from the point of view of an embedded agent in a way that, that looks like computer science. And that immediately raises a problem, which is self-reference. And we know where that gets to get you to girls there, under very, very general assumptions. So uh, Girdle warns us that this theory is going to end up not being both consistent. Um, and, and warns us that that's something we just have to deliver. So um, that's that's the end of part one. <laughs> um, now what I want to do is actually talk about space and do it from this kind of scale-free perspective. So, can I ask a quick question, please? Yeah, on that last slide, the, what is the semantics level, the semantic mapping on a, on a computer? It's like we have programs that are actually basically mapping the output some interpretation of the hardware, are the semantics another program, semantic mapping, or is that us looking at the program for it? Well, um, think about processes like variable binding, right? As, as soon as you get up to a language where you can talk about variable binding, um, if, if I have a variable and I'm binding some, some structure to it, and I can also bind that variable to other kinds of structures, then we can think about what that structure means to me. <laughs> I have some, some, some notion of what to means. It was never. But from the point of view of that program, uh, at least two means something different from three <laughs> because if, if I bind the variable to two, then I do something different if I bind the variable to three. And the basis of semantics, you know, go back to Gregory Bateson, <laughs> is if, if, there's a, if there's a difference that makes a difference to me, that's, that's in some sense actionable, that's the basis of semantics. It's the basis of meaningfulness. So you have some, at least minimal sense of meaningfulness as soon as you have variables, a distinction between variables and constants. And you have one structure that, that leads to different actions under different circumstances. Um, so the other, the other way to think of it is when we are describing what programs are doing, we are naturally ascribing the semantics to the program. So we're, we're imposing a model theory 
in formal terms on this bunch of syntax, on mm -hmm. this language. And when we look at different kinds of languages, we put very different model theories on top of them. Uh, so the languages uh, you know, naturally have different semantic structures because the you know, model theories we use are typically very different. So it's that very stripped down version of semantics that we can refer to. Um, um, there is some voices in computer science that don't have distinction between software and hardware. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'm asking that because here, do you require that the hardware should be a universal tuning machine? Or, no. or so it's, it no. can be any. It can be anything. So, I mean, if we look at biology, it's all hardware. Right. In a sense. Um, yeah, it's just we're, we're describing the hard, hardware at different scales. And we're building the hardware right. as we go. That's that's even more strong statement. If the 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 hardware should not be not need necessarily need to be universal. Yeah. I mean, I, in a sense, if you if you take this informational information theory way of thinking about physics, right? Seriously, you get you know back to the grandfather John Wheeler. <laughs> And his proclamation that physics is information theory. <laughs> so hardware is software. Right. And that underlies a lot of, that's much of the underlying philosophy of this whole transition that's occurred in quantum theory in the last 30 years. What's that? Um, pardon? What's that? John, John Archibald Wheeler who was an associate of Walter Bohr and Einstein. So he kind of combined their different ways of thinking. And he was the person who sort of, I think he came up with the name Black Hole. <laughs> he, he was part of that re rebirth of general relativity in the late 60s, mid late 60s. And, wrote a, a, a sequence of papers that can be seen as the founding papers of, of quantum information, motivated a lot of those people who were working early on in that area. Okay, so let's talk about space-time, and, and Wheeler's a good place to start, because one of Wheeler's kind of dicta was, you have to start physics without space-time, figure out where space-time comes from. So this is a massive departure from the you know, Einsteinian view that space-time is a physical fundamental, even though Einstein also said from a philosophical point of view, space-time is some derivative thing that is somehow observer-dependent. So this notion of space-time being observer-relative runs deeply through current quantum cosmology. So let's think about space. And let's think first about absolutely uniform environment. Nothing is happening. But, so I look at the environment, and it, none of it looks any different to me. And nothing's going on. So now I'm in heaven. <laughs> all your boundaries are not all the same. And, <laughs> your boundaries are not all the same. <laughs> yeah, well, now you've got to get this somehow or another. <laughs> so, so this is where I want to start. And um, an organism that's living in an environment like this is obviously not an organism and not living um, because nothing's going on in its environment. But we can think of this as an abstraction. Think, okay, how do I build up a meaningful environment from this? And how do I start putting a space time on it? How do I put some sort of coordinate system on this environment so that I can tell about you know, what's going on over there. What's going on over there. So the first thing that you've got to do is somehow segment the environment into parts that are different. 
So let's say that we can start to segment the environment so that at least different parts of it look different, even if nothing is happening. So we have some part of the environment that looks different from some other part of the environment. But now we can ask, is there any sense of, of relationship between these parts? And obviously the way that I've drawn it, um, visually to us, there's a relationship, but I haven't said that there's a relationship. So right now, actually, I just have an environment that's a set of two parts. And we can make it a little bit more explicit by going to four parts. So at the top, I just have a set of segments. And I haven't said anything about what segment is next to what other segment, for example. Even though visually, I obviously have to think of it in a way where one of these segments is next to the other segments. You can just think of this as a heap <laughs> or a pile. So I can take this set and I can add some structure to it by adding some topology. And the simplest thing to add to it is some kind of graph structure. So I say, okay, this piece is next to this piece, and this piece is next to this piece, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I can take this and turn it into a graph. And I draw the little connections as if they were gap junctions to sort of suggest something about planes of cells that can talk to each other. And they know that they know that they have a neighbor. Um, there's some cells they can talk to, and other cells that they can't talk to, so that they don't know anything about. Them. So now um, there's still nothing happening, even though the environment has a little bit of topological structure. But once you have some topological structure, once you you have more than just a set of distinctions, you have a structured set of distinctions. We can talk about something happening. So let's talk about something really simple, simple happening. Um, there's something happens in part of the environment, and then something happens in some other part of the environment. And I can tell these parts of the environment are distinct because I, I've broken this symmetry that allows me to move the parts of the environment around by making some things connected and other things not connected. So we can represent this in uh, a really simple way. We can say in uh, the top panel there, uh, a black dot has appeared in the light green square. And I represent this by an up arrow and, and green subscript and a black dot. And this is this is actually the notation one uses in quantum field theory. <laughs> so one can think of this as a what's called a raising operator, which just creates a field excitation in the green part of the field. And what it creates is this black dot. And then we can think of a different state <clears throat> where the black dot has disappeared from the green part of the field, the light green bit and has appeared in the, in the uh, dark blue bit. So that's a representation of something happening. And these black dots are now kind of excitations of a kind of field that can create black dots. So they're not yet objects in an intuitive sense. They're objects in the way that, say, electrons are objects, where if I have, if an electron appears over here and an electron appears over there from out of the quantum vacuum, then the question of, is this the same electron as that never arises? It's not even a meaningful question. Uh, they have exactly the same properties of their location, but whether they count as the very same thing is, is a meaningless question. So at, at this level of, of description, that's still a meaningless question. So we have a space where something's happening, but you can't, there's no sense of 
for there being an object in this ratio. But even in this really very simple, simple system, you can think about uh, an observer that has enough memory to keep track of this sort of thing happening over an extended period of time. So an extended internal period of time because it's with respect to some internal memory that counts against. So if you've got that kind of multi-step memory, you can see state transitions like this, where something happens in part of your environment, and then something happens in another part of your environment, and something happens in the first part, and something happens in the second part. And anytime you have that kind of periodic behavior, that's a clock in your environment. And it's a clock because you have enough memory to see periodic behavior. So you, to have that much memory, you have to have an internal counter that counts experiences and labels them in your memory. So I can say, oh, I've seen that state before. As soon as you can say, I've seen that state before, and you can watch quite a few of them, and you have this kind of periodic behavior on the clock. So notice what this does and does not require. You can define a clock in your environment if you have distinguishable environment sectors that have some topology that prevents them from being arbitrarily exchangeable. So you've got these connections, you've got this graph structure. You need some kind of flip-flop <laughs> that's implemented um, on that structure, <clears throat> uh, and you have to have a memory. But it doesn't require object identity. We've implemented it just with this quantum field theoretic notion of, of events happening in one place or happening in another place. And you don't have to have a metric space. You don't have to have any sense of distance. So you've got a really, really minimal structure on your spatial representation of your environment. But you now have a nice external time reference frame uh, that you can look at other events with respect to. So this tells us something really important, I think, for biology, which is that time is more fundamental than space. We can expect organisms uh, even single cells, to be able to measure time in their environments before we can expect to see them measuring space within their environments. And, you know, organisms that we know about have things like diurnal cycles, mm -hmm. uh, even bacteria that we don't have any real reason to believe impose a geometric structure on their environments. Even though even bacteria distinguish sort of part of their membrane from the native part of their membrane. That's the whole way that bacteria, you know, implement chemotaxis. Yeah. Just what you said. They're, they're, they're so, they're, they, they want to look towards a gradient, but they're so small that one side of their body and the other side of their body are at the same concentration for all practical purposes. They, they, they cannot measure a gradient in space. They measure it in time because that's what works. Yeah. And even the poor bacteria, I mean, movement came, came later, right? The first organisms didn't, didn't move much. That makes all the sense. At, at, at least I don't right now intuitively can guess how you would measure space without movement. It's going to be it's probably possible for some like light diffraction patterns. But without that, um, as, but, you know, if you can't move, it's going to be way easier to measure the difference in time than you're going to come up to it in space. So it makes sense that that was involved. Yeah, I, mean, in front of you I, that. I would expect that even that period that can move, or even your ball box that mm -hmm. can move, may not be representing motion. Mm -hmm. So they may not be representing objects. And so stuff is more easy to represent 
Francis Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now let's think about leveraging motion. Um, I'm sorry. Can I can I ask a physics related question? Sure. How does this relate to the isotropy of space? Because if you compartmentalize space into different um, cells, it does need to have a certain kind of, uh, well, arrangement so that light in one direction and in a diagonal direction, for instance, takes the same time to arrive at a certain distance, right? Uh, yeah, let's get to that in a little bit when okay. we can talk about metrics. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think that's really a metric question, or almost a metric question. Okay, let's think about what do you need to observe motion. Um, what do you need to be able to say that there's some object that's moving around in my mind? So, um, suppose that I have this black dot. And it's, it's exchanging its position between light green and dark blue. But now I want to see that as motion. So to see that as motion, I need to add an assumption, which is this, this black dot is not just a field excitation of some quantum field. It's actually a thing. And what it means to be a thing is that it persists through time. It has some identity through time. So that I can say that when it's in the dark blue square, it's actually the same thing that used to be in the white green square. And that, that same thing is going to move now again and be in the, the white green square. So object persistence this, this idea that I have a thing is deeply, deeply related to the notion of translational invariance, which is one of the fundamental symmetries that allows you to define the space, the space time of the sort that we have. Um, so we have to make this extra assumption that moving something doesn't change its identity. And similarly, moving something in the space doesn't change the structure of the space. So I have to make this assumption, and this is part of translational invariance. If I move an object from here to there, I don't change the topology of the space. Remember, we don't have a geometry yet. So we have to assume that we still have to assume that it doesn't can change the connectivity structure of my space to move something in. So what I, what I want to emphasize here is that this notion of object persistence is a classical idea. Uh, it's, it's not the idea that arises naturally in quantum field theory, which says simply that, that something appears and something else appears, but they have no persistence idea. And I think we can think about the entire history of 80 years of interpretations of quantum mechanics, but you know, hundreds of books and thousands of articles written discussing metaphysics, basically, as all being really a debate about object persistence and what the meaning of object persistence is. Because as soon as you have object persistence, you've made the transition from a purely quantum theory to a theory that's quantum. Object persistence is, is what really defines classical information. It's I can write it then, and I can write it here, and I can come back tomorrow and it's going to be here. And, I can move it. and there might be some noise, but up to the noise, it's the same bit that I went there before. That's a classical idea. So here's the quantum to classical transition it's the assumption of object persistence. I think it's worth thinking about where that assumption comes from. Chris, can I ask a question if you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you go back to the previous slide, uh, could we also not, in a sense, think of the sectors, the green, blue sectors as 
also as things because they persist, even though they do not show any motion. Could we not think of those sectors also as things because of um, persistence? I've, I've represented them this way um, <clears throat> to, to have a visual depiction. Um, but the, the intuition I'm trying to get across is um, an intuition of, of, of location or distinction between different parts of the environment. So we don't tend to think of, you know, this little piece of space as an object, right? You know, a little, some little voxel somewhere between me and the window. Uh, we just tend to think of that as, as part of our coordinate system. So I've, I've drawn it in this visual way, which suggests object to it. But, you know, the, a very a, a kind of a voxel in my space is really different from something that I can put into that voxel. So, so this thing that I can move around as an object, whereas the kind of voxel is an abstraction. So yeah, I don't think they're the same thing at all. I see, it's, I, I guess uh, I, I'm not an expert in physics or relativity, or but doesn't Einstein's theory of space-time say something about how space-time could be deformed or moved or stretched and contracted? So doesn't it suggest that space is also an object in a way? Uh, maybe yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a couple of slides. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hold hold your breath on that one. <laughs> so so I, I wanna I want to talk a little bit about object persistence more. And and just and, and and let us think about that from kind of a developmental psychology point of view. This is how we learned about object persistence. And we 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 get this in about the first three months. Of infancy, we do this kind of motor babbling, and we do it with objects. And we don't have a, a, a handy, colorful thing. We just look at our own limbs. And notice what's happening here. And this picture illustrates it really well. There's visual attention, and there's also motor attention. So what we're doing when we're doing this motor babbling is we're coupling a, a somatosensory and proprioceptive representation of our body with a visual representation of our body. <clears throat> and the visual representation is assigning objecthood to this thing that's otherwise a motor representation. So what's a motor representation? It's a representation among other things, is the amount of energy I have to spend. It's effortful to do this, and I can sense that effort. So, and this is this is very indirectly getting to Santosh's question. I'm starting to couple the ideas of energy and objecthood by doing this sort of thing, and I'm also coupling it to the idea of persistence over time and manipulability. So these are deep, deep, deep intuitions that we have. And um, I think we can say, just based on physiological analogy as well as behavioral analogy, these are deep, deep intuitions that animals have. And maybe even the vertebrates have. So we can think about space pretty easily from the point of view of, say, a dog, <laughs> uh, and maybe even we can think about space from the point of view of something like a frog or a fish. Um, but we don't have a good way, of, or at least I don't have a good way of, of thinking intuitively about space from the point of view of something like an insect that has a super different developmental process than mine and isn't obviously doing this kind of process 
It was the process that taught me what space was. So uh, I think we, we need to think about that when we're thinking about space in terms of biological systems. So let's just in the final segment here, think about what it takes to start to impose a geometry on space. So if I want to build a coordinate system, I want to build a, a geometry, and I already have motion, I need to have motion with respect to something. So I need some sort of designated preferred position. I can say, okay, I'm moving relative to this. And as soon as I've got that, I can start to build some other invariances. So I can start to think about, for example, rotational invariance, because now I can tell I'm rotating, because I can say, okay, this isn't rotating, but this is rotating. So now I can think about rotational invariance in the same way that I think about translational invariance. And if I want to think about three-dimensional space, I can think about kind of size. So if I, if I move something, it gets smaller. And if I put it closer to me, it gets bigger. I, I learned that when I was three months old. I had my rattle when I was moving around because I have this mother to me. Um, you can also think of that as, as a kind of energetic dimension. So if my object is uh, over here, I have to spend energy to get to it in a way that I don't have to spend that energy if it's right here. So you can think of this building this third dimension in various ways. But you always have to have this origin to build any kind of geometry. So once I have this, I can also do something really radical, which is imagine like 20 degrees. And uh, I think it's an interesting question to ask what animals are capable of representing themselves as moving, as opposed to representing their environments as moving. And I don't know how to answer the question. I think it's a really interesting question. So uh, finally, I don't just need an origin if I want a coordinate system. I have to have a ruler. So I have to have a spatial reference for it that consists of this origin and some ruler. And my ruler has to be um, translationally and rotationally invariant up to some transformation. And, and here we get to the relationship between, say, Euclidean space, where the ruler is invariant to translations and rotations, um, and, and something like um, space in general relativity, where if I move my ruler around, it changes length. And if I rotate my ruler, it changes length. And that length change is a representation of mass in general relativity, as, as Santosh Santos was pointing out. So, in fact, it's, it's not that the space is a representation of the object. It's the change in the metric that represents mass in, in general relativity. So it's the way my ruler changes as I move it. And that's a, I think that's a, a very interesting concept, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. So once I have these things, once I have this spatial reference frame, um, now I can talk about objects moving in a geometry. And I have what, what we consider intuitively in space. So notice how much more complicated this is than a clock, right? It's simple to get a clock. It's really complicated to get this. Space is a much more complicated notion than, than external time. Okay, so we're almost done. Um, I just wanna think a little bit abstractly now and interdisciplinarily now and think about approaches to emergent space. In the, in the physics literature, uh, especially quantum information, and to a somewhat lesser extent, 
under the rubric of quantum cosmology, there's a large industry of hundreds, thousands of papers um, that are working on emergent space time. And it's it's all in a, in a deeply technical, difficult language. And this route involves many, many variants on starting from some sort of information exchange and, and usually entanglement and working through the idea of error correction uh, and error correcting codes and through the idea of lattice like so discrete network types of topology to get to some sort of space time and in particular by always adding a bunch of different kinds of assumptions to get to Einstein's equations to, to get to a space time that supports some idea of, of mass or gravity or energy density. I mean, all of those are equivalent. So some sense of a metric that changes when you do certain things. Now there's a completely different approach, which isn't expressed in incredibly complicated mathematics but it's expressed in the language of developmental psychology. And that way of thinking about space-time starts with perceptual motor capabilities. So it starts from, from motor babbling. Uh, and it talks about the measurement of effort. Uh, so it assigns an energy coordinate uh, at the top. And it talks about memory and it talks about objects. Uh, and invariances. So, talks about the ability to move something around. So, this is the same thing that I'm rotating it. Blah, blah, blah. And from there, it builds this notion of, of a metric space. And that metric space has at least some implicit energetic coordinate that has to do with distance. And um, it also has sort of an energetic component that has to do with mass. So I know that there are things in my space that require a lot more effort to manipulate than other things in my space. But in, in this way of thinking about it, that notion of effort and mass is not really anchored in the space. It becomes a different concept. It becomes this classical notion of mass. And the question is, do these routes eventually produce the same thing? And the, the, the sort of obvious answer is no, right? The obvious answer is that the, the left-hand side, this, this very recent, you know, two decade, two or three decade effort in theoretical physics that starts really from string theory, uh, produces this, this very abstract notion of space that gives you Einstein's equations. But is that really true? I mean, one gets general relativity just by thinking about symmetries in our ordinary conception of space that people haven't really focused on before. Right? Einstein really derived general relativity from the equivalence principle, which is the idea that acceleration and mass are the same. He did it with all these thought experiments of people in elevators and things like that. So in a sense, general relativity follows from our classical thinking about space when you notice some symmetries that you haven't noticed before, and you wrap some mathematics that you haven't had before. So maybe these paths really do converge. And I think if they do converge, it's really interesting. Um, because it tells us something about the relationship between physics and biology uh, that I think is important. And um, what I, I hope I've convinced you today is that there's at least some possibility that maybe these two paths really are leading to the same thing. Really, we can think about constructing space time from an organism of point of view. So I'll just leave you with one picture, which is that organisms and maybe some systems that aren't organisms, we can manage to construct this cycle. <laughs> 
from memory to object persistence to error correction, which I really haven't talked about much here, to space time. Uh, I'll, I'll just make one comment that, that space is really useful because it means that I can, I can correct errors. I can put things in space and expect them to be there. And that gives me an external memory. So when I have space, I have stimulating memory, I have a whole lot of error correction. I can use my ID card to remember my name. Um, so, so organisms can do this, and that raises the question, which I think we can view as a phylogenetic question, of how did this start? Um, where in phylogeny does this cycle get going? And uh, how does this cycle change in different parts of phylogeny? Uh, how do different parts of, of phylogeny implement this cycle? And I think that's a, a really interesting question in evolutionary biology that's worth thinking about. So I'll close with that. Thank you very much. I know how to be a G thing once. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're basically at one o'clock. So if there are a few questions, that's great. You, you My next step is to go to the airport. So. <laughs> <laughs> You remember the experiment that I'm not allowed to do today is in Google Cosmos. There are and there is another experiment in that category. Uh, there was some carousel that two kittens connected with a hinge together. Mm. One of them, uh, it's a carousel that is completely closed and there is stripes in that carousel. And one kitten is able to use his legs and to move, but his movement affect the other kitten mm -hmm. that they folded and they're not allowed him to use the legs mm. and they they put that kitten from from the beginning like that the result was that that kitten was blind mm -hmm. and there is nothing wrong with that kitten mm -hmm. only because he never used his legs to close the loop with the environment ah, okay so Thank his you. movement were on, com completely not connected to him it's the, the other cut so they released that cut later on. I don't remember exactly the time numbers, that, uh, how many uh, months they put it there, but they released him and they let him use the, 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 uh, the legs and he get back his eyesight. So maybe that related to this wow. kind of thing. Yeah. I bet no one can do that experiment today. But, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one can, one can easily think of experiments would be incredibly informative and completely inevitable. I guess I'm in purpose. I like this because I, I, I feel like you get this at the molecular level, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think you can think of space as being any area with less resistance, right? So if you were to define what space is, in this room, most people would say, well, it's the air, right? It's, this is the object, whatever, it's, it has more resistance. But I think a molecule does this too, right? Because as a molecule binds to another atom and it changes, it has a memory of what it bound to. Mm -hmm. And now you have object persistence, right? Because now you have a different structure, which changes the way the thing interacts all the way through. And it has error correction because it doesn't bind, it, it, it won't bind to a molecule that doesn't have the right, you know, valence electrons around it. So, you know, once that bumps into each other, it will reject it out mm -hmm. and then it'll grab the other one, right? So I think you're seeing all of this, you know, not even at the organism level, but at, at the molecular level. Great. <laughs> Next. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I would love to be able to do psychology, if you want, <laughs> at the molecular I'm scale, gonna put it <laughs> and really think about um, these things as agents that are, in some sense, cognitive. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're all crystalline lattices. That's all we are. You know, all the information that we're transferring and thinking about, all of that is being transferred through crystal and lattice. So what will be the memory in that kind of thing? The structure. Yeah, the structural memory and 
I think there's, there's in a sense, also this can work in that in the molecules can write on their environments in ways that are persistent and in ways they, that they can go back to and get information. At least I would hypothesize that molecules are doing that. Certainly, organisms are doing that all the time. Yeah. There's a cool experiment in field mice when they leave like literal markers on the ground yeah. that are visually distinct from the rest to remember where to go. Yeah. And I mean, the, the word came originally from social insects, the yeah. trails or memory. If we, you know, <laughs> molecules using stick merging memories would be a super cool result. If you can really nail it in there. Makes me wonder if uh, this period of the time when I would talk about valence as like a basic kind of foundation for cognition. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you just mentioned like you know, basically all of biology, it's just chemistry, it's just physics, um, of uh, electric interactions, basically mostly valence of electrons. This might be like a complete no no <laughs> common uh, relationship between those two, but that's basically all that that mm -hmm. molecules do to an extent. Positive and negative charges, positive and negative experiences. <laughs> so, so Mike's here is taking notes to talk to Mark Solms about this. <laughs> yeah, I think there's also good examples of all the stuff that you could put together with like systems neuroscience as well, which speaks to your first point of the scale free stuff, right? It's probably all the same. Like I, I'd be more surprised if it wasn't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Makes people like you go are healthy. Yeah, yeah, that's all I I think it's true. Is it okay here to give this course? Or? Um, well, I came here to see the lab and meet people. Uh -huh. I like, like, like lots of fun and help. Are you are you staying around? Yeah. Are you staying around for a bit, or do you have to leave like right away for the airport? No, I'm going. I'm going to go take the train. To the yeah. Okay. Can I ask uh, a last question, maybe a very naive one? Why is there three spatial dimensions? I'm, I'm sorry. Can I ask a naive question? Um, why is there three spatial dimensions and not two or one, for instance? Is there a particular reason to that? Um, that is there, there's some mathematical facts about three space that I can never ignore that are really, right. really interesting. Mm. And like building knots or something like this. I mean, you cannot do everything in two dimensions or right. also in one, yeah. But, um, but there are also things that you can do in three dimensions that you can't, for example, do in four dimensions. Ah, okay. So a, uh, you know, four dimensions plus time would be uh, would not allow certain symmetries that we depend on to, <laughs> to, uh, to kind of have some coherent notion of objects. So, and, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember what these things are, but uh, that's a really interesting question, and a lot of people work on it. And uh, an important part of it is, is why three, not four or more? And, and three turns out to have unique pro unique geometric properties that are really cool. Yeah. So it, when people talk about extra dimensions in string theory or something like that, all the extra spatial dimensions have to be rolled up into tiny little packages so that they don't interfere with, with doing anything macroscopically. Mm -hmm. Where macroscopic mm -hmm. is, you know, above the Planck scale. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is really interesting. Um... Also, if it's about, um, well, distinguishing between objects, then also this questions if uh, space can be continuous, for instance, because making very, very small changes in a continuous way won't lead you to different positions, right? So, Yeah, this, this is where the, the limitations imposed by energy density really make a difference. Uh, you know, the, the Planck scale is tiny, but... Um, if you if you try to go to go beyond that, the 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 energy densities are so high that it 
it sort of feels like you're getting big again. <laughs> um, it, it's again, I don't have a good intuitive grasp on that, but the 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 existence of this energy distance re relationship um, kind of gives you a fundamental desecration of space for free, yeah. and. Uh, when you look at these quantum information type images, they're they're all based in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, and there's been mm -hmm. a, a huge transition away from the kind of old quantum mechanics where everything was done in continuous Hilbert spaces to the much much simpler representation of doing things in finite dimensions. Uh, the downside of that it means that that all of Continuous mathematics like differential equations becomes an approximation on uh, a dynamics that's conceptually simpler, but but from a computational point of view, much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's it's really hard to grasp. Um, I, I when when I studied this stuff, uh, I always imagined space time to be some kind of a cellular automaton, where you have like your little space grids and uh, well communicating with each other with the speed of light, something like this, that being the clock time of the of the automaton. But it feels like it's much more dynamic and space is really emergent and more like a, a property you assign to particles or, or anything that distinguishes them from each other and, and uh, allows you to build correlations on top of other degrees of freedom. So, yeah, yeah. 